who wrote a PhD at the Leiden University, was appointed at several Canadian universities and returned to Leiden and is now lecturer in paleography at the University of Leiden. He is leader of a prestigious project, Turning Over a New Leaf, Manuscript Innovation in the 12th Century Renaissance on a new type of pre-Gothic manuscript that emerged around 1100. Uh, one of his recent discoveries is a medical manuscript that a medical, medical manuscript uh, already known, but he discovered it was a century older than it was thought before and was made during the lifetime of its 11th century author, Constantine the African. And today he will speak about anonymous page dimensions in the 11th and 12th centuries. Um, this paper comes out of a book I'm writing with uh, Francis Newton, um, Emeritus Professor of Classics at uh, Duke University, which is devoted to this very um, medical manuscript that was just mentioned. Um, I'm using that manuscript to spark the discussion, but which will be much broader. But uh, I was first sort of uh, struck by the theme of this talk, which is the narrow book, which I'd sort of seen before but never realized its significance until that very manuscript came in my eyes. Um, and so we will look a little about the detail of the manuscript and then move into a broader uh, sort of discussion. So this paper is instigated by one manuscript and poses one simple question. Let's first um, very briefly introduce that book, then pose a simple question, and then return to the book in more depth. Um, this is the manuscript uh, I'm talking about, which is in, in the Royal Library of The Hague, and the significance of the find, I guess, is not so much the finding of the book as if it had fallen out of its, uh, of its shelf behind the bookcase and then was retrieved again, no, that's not the case, of course. Um, the significance, I think, of this is that it was dated in the 12th century, although there was one scholar in the early 20th century had seen that it was perhaps very early 12th century. Um, but when I sent these images to um, a colleague in um, Duke University, and we were both part of a group of medical historians, I'm not a medical historian, but I was asked to um, date, retake some of the medical books that they worked with. Um, when that happened, that sending of the images uh, across the ocean, he realized that yes, it was indeed late 11th century as I proposed, but also it was made in the monastery where the translator of this work um, was operating, so to speak. So this is a book um, of medical, first medical handbook, uh, translated from Arabic by Constantine the African in the monastery of Mont Cassino, um, south of Rome. Um, now also, then, this book was not only the carrier of that text, but also the carrier of the oldest version of the text, namely the version that was likely on the desk of the translator. Um, there's a number of arguments for this, which I will not touch on, um, but that will sort of be part of that book that we're writing as well. Then a simple question, which might be more um, relevant for me, not not relevant, but um, I, was, I was struck by the images, some of the images that we just looked at, and, and uh, the question that I'm going to ask now is, why is this book so narrow? Um, but you, if you are working with printed books, might actually not find this a very particularly interesting question, because it is maybe not so narrow to your eyes, but for me, uh, coming from the medieval period, this is actually a quite narrow manuscript. Um, be aware that what you look at is a stretched out version of the PowerPoint that I submitted. So everything is much broader for some reason. Um, so in a, in a sense, this is actually back to its normal medieval proportions. Uh, but it is actually the, the image that ought to be much, much more uh, narrow. You can see that the, the yellow letters as well, it's, it's too stretched out. Okay, so why is this book so narrow? Um, to do this, I need to do um, a, a number of other things, so let me do that first, which is to look at the dimensions of medieval manuscripts in general. This is very important to do in detail because that's going to lead us to uh, the aha moment, which is ah, so it is indeed quite irregular, this size, anomalous perhaps. Uh, the measurements of the book are 235 by 128, which makes it a very small book, but also um, a book that is quite slim and high, namely, um, if you have the height um, that is one unit one, 
and then the relative width would be 0.55, you see what I mean? So the width is almost half of the height of the book. This is in relative proportions. Normally what happens in medieval manuscripts is somewhere between 0.76 and 0.72. This is not just a random guess, but this is based on uh, quantitative studies by the French and Dutch scholars from a range of studies um, that include a, a sort of a vicinity of 6,000 manuscripts. So we are in the medieval period, um, relative width compared to height um, ranges between 67% uh, and 72%, if you, see, if you see what I mean. This is important, so if you are very confused, you should speak up now. <laughs> um, it varies, uh, for example, in the Carolingian period, the average is about 0.74, so it's relatively broad, broader. Um, compared to the 11th century, when it is 0.69, you might want to say, well, 0.69 and 0.71, that can hardly be such a big difference. But it is actually quite astonishingly different if you look at it, if you put the two books next to each other. If you have looked a lot at the medieval books, this is something that jumps right off from the, from the very objects. Um, the interesting thing is that you can say this is a norm in medieval uh, manuscript production because we have, for example, a little um, evidences for this, which add up to quite a significant uh, number of um, sort of details that shows you that this is actually uh, people, people the scribes thought about this and, and thought about this is what we ought to do, and if we don't, then something odd appears. So let me give you some examples. We have a, a very nice marginalia in the 9th century manuscript that actually outlines what the dimensions of the page ought to be, and for example, it says the width uh, ought to be four fifths of the height and the height of the text block ought to be so much of the width, and then the margins are two for the top and three for the bottom. So this is all in relative sizes. This is just to show you a little example that medieval scribes didn't just think, you know, it's Monday morning, let's make the book like this. No, this is actually um, something that they were thinking about to the extent that they could verbalize it, they could actually make it very pronounced and say, this is what it is. So uh, probably reflecting the, their manner of production, they probably for each book that they designed, and of course we're talking about parchment, and therefore not standard sizes, you have to make calculations for every single book you produced. Um, they probably every single time would say, okay, so four, fifth, etc. They may even have had instruments um, that help them with this. So you can say that if a book is not according to those norms, that it perhaps breaks with a norm, and that it was perhaps perceived as being different. But we're not there yet because I can. I can sort of allude to it, but you're not yet saying, yes, you are right. Um, to, to do that, I need to go a little bit further. Um, second observation is that there's very few books that are actually breaking with the uh, tradition that I just mentioned, the range. Um, say, it all, most of them hover around 0.7 um, uh, compared to um, the height, which is 1, as I said. Um, the quantitative studies of the French um, indicate that a book that is narrower than 0.57, so it's actually getting to be very narrow, uh, that range is about 1.3% of surviving medieval manuscripts. So you can see how unusual it is to have a book of this proportion, with this, say not this, because it's stretched out, but if you go to the Hague and look at the real thing. Third point here uh, is to listen to a medieval voice, and we have these, we have two of them. One is from the 9th century, that is to say, one is an 11th century uh, person in St. Gallen reflecting on a 9th century manuscript, and the manuscript in question is um, this one. Um, it's Codex Sangalensis uh, 53, which measures, measures uh, 390 by 230, is 0.57. Um, Eckhart, the local historian in the early 11th century, uh, remarks sort of on the uh, production of this particular manuscript, which is 9th century. And he says, well, this was made with um, wax tablets that belonged to uh, Charles the Great. He had next to his bed um, when he wanted to get to sleep. And we used the uh, diptych, sort of the, the open wax tablet, as um, sort of decoration on the outside of the book, which is why we made it so narrow as it is. And he describes this book then as an Evangelium longum. So, for us, it's important, 0.57 width is received in the 11th century, the 11th century as a long or tall uh, manuscript, 
The second um, voice from the Middle Ages is from a little bit later, 15th century, the Charter House Neulich near Utrecht, where one Hector of Moordrecht, died in 1465, local Carthusian, um, remarks in two books that they are actually quite off. He says by these particular two manuscripts, and one is Letters of Paul, 13th century, with a relative width of 0.64, and the other one, uh, work by Bernardus, of a um, width of 0.63. In both cases, he writes in the, uh, on the first page that the formatio, so the format of these two books, is off because they are tall and too narrow, or tall and not long, not wide enough. So the perception, even by 0.64, which is sort of getting to the average of 0.68, 0.72, what I mentioned, is seen as you know striking, so much so that you say it's not wide enough, but also that you write this remark uh, in the book itself, as to say, you know, gosh, I'm surprised by this. What's happening? What's going on? This is, it fits in the Carthusian circles, because you also have Carthusians reflecting on the quality of the text, the quality of the script, etc. So they're very verbal about the book, which makes it very interesting, of course, from a historical point of view. All this is to conclude, for now, this is the first part, um, that we can safely say that this manuscript in The Hague was most likely purposefully made narrow. Because if it is so unusual to be so narrow, if um, there is remarks of the period itself by individuals saying this is a very narrow and unusual book, when you do so, make it very narrow, it must um, likely be uh, because you have a certain purpose for it. So what might that purpose be? That there's an additional argument which I'm going to refer to now and then um, be done with it, which is it's in two columns. And if you calculate the height of the book and see what these two columns ought to be, it's about, they're about double as narrow as they ought to be in a normal size two column book of that length. They ought to be uh, twice as big as broad. So this is to say that it's, it looks odd, it's very cramped and the writing is very small, so as to get two columns on the page. This was not a book that should have been designed for the design that it has, if you see what I mean. You what I mean. So let's find out why these, let's call them holster books, as some people have called them in the past, um, why they were made in this fashion. And I have gathered uh, a database of 80 of these, and you see uh, the first 25 here, uh, which is, you know, in footnotes you find references 2, 3, 4, or 5, so I, I worked hard to get 80 together, so get a good statistical sample, but you can say, Still, it's not enough, but it's very hard to get these as it is. Um, and out of this sort of uh, this data, there are three major uh, conclusions to be drawn as um, to the potential use of these holster books. One is um, the book that is decorated with an ivory cutting, and this is already mentioned before the Evangelium Longum. Um, the ivory cutting apparently made it necessary for the book to get narrower. That's to say, apparently book designers thought it was important when you have a narrow, very pronounced uh, decoration theme on the front of the book, then the whole book should obey by this uh, narrowness and also uh, take on that shape. So is there evidence of ivory cuttings on the top of the book, on the binding? No, there is not. Plus, and this is also something I've skipped because it's, it's way too much argument in, uh, in the margin of my argument, so to speak. Um, usually these books are very elaborate, high quality script, decoration, gold, etc. Um, whereas the, the Hague manuscript is very scruffy. It's made of very cheap parchment, which is the argument you can make very easily, which is also part of the, of the book project that I mentioned before. Second group of holster books um, are music manuscripts. We have um, Cantatoria, we have Tropers, and all of these um, to 1200, really almost all of the Cantatoria and 100% of the Tropers are made um, very narrow fashion. So here's an example. We also have a reference to one of these in the 8th century by uh, Amal uh, Amalarius of Metz who says that the Cantor, without being obliged to read the text, holds in his hands the Cantatorium. And here's of course the first hint of where I'm going. Um, it's easy to hold a book that is so narrow, and I've tested it um, with this particular, the, the Higmans, but also others. What happens when you hold a very narrow book? It shifts the weight from the fingertips and the thumb to the heart, the palm of the hand. So, so the actual book 
weight slides to the palm of the hand. And only then is it possible to stand like this for a long time, for example, to sing. And that, I guess that's why 100% of the choppers that we have, 1,200, is actually that narrow. It makes very much sense, but you have, you have, to, you have to say so to discover it. Um, so a narrow book is easy to hold for a long period of time. There's an there's an additional argument here, which we'll I'll introduce it in a moment. Third category of holster books in this group of 80, by far the largest ones, um, is uh, classical texts, the main of classical texts. We have, for example, Stages in Five Manuscripts, Taurus in Four, Ovid in Four, Virgil Three, Cicero Two, Lupin, Christian, Prudentius, Terence in Two copies. Um, there is also some ancient philosophy, Porphyrius, Isago, um, and we have Plato's Timaeus. What binds these, this group, this third group, is education. Uh, most um, classical books in the 11th and 12th centuries, uh, so the, the most popular setting of use of these texts in the 11th and 12th centuries uh, was the school, where they, for example, used for the trivium, grammar, dialectics, rhetorics, and it's uh, abundant evidence, uh, evidence from book lists that we have from monasteries and also from cathedral schools. Uh, this is so evident that I'm going to stop talking about it, but the most predominant use of these texts, and therefore also the objects that carry them, is in a setting of education. Two examples. Sorry, going through my tropes here. Uh, this is a very narrow book, not on this image, but if you travel to Sun Garland, you'll see how narrow it is. It's stretched out again. It's very unfortunate. Um, 0.51, uh, which makes it very high in the list. This one was used by four schoolmasters, so we have, apart from sort of the internal evidence of the text itself, we also have lots of these books in um, sort of these classical texts in the 80, the group of 80 that were studied, um, actually have evidence that they were in fact used by uh, schoolmasters. And here we have one that was actually in the by four school masters, their names, contemporary names, very early 12th century, are written on the first flyleaf. These books, but this book was used by such and such for this reason. It's, very, it's, a, it's a beautiful case. Um, another example is that others have concluded that certain books um, were used by school masters, and among these are also old books. So this is one that features in the study by um, Reynolds on medieval reading. So, if you combine these observations, namely, many Holster books have texts um, that were used in education, and we have actual Holster books that we know were used by masters in a setting of education. Um, you can say there's an interdependence between Holster format and education, especially since um, there's no evidence of the first group. That is to say, that there's no, it's not very likely that this particular Hague manuscript. Um, was made for uh, so narrow because there was sort of a diptych or, or an ivory cutting on the front. Uh, nor was it sung. I, mean, I don't think you, anybody in their right minds would sing uh, sort of uh, anatomical tracts to a group of people. We should try it and see if it worked, but I don't think it's a good. So I would argue that this particular book and holster books alike that are used in education, and the Pontangi, of course, is a text, as you've mentioned that before, that is very popular in education very early on, so the first trace of it in the 1140s in Salerno, that it was a popular tract for students to learn the medical uh, trade from. Uh, I would say the narrow shape of the book points out that it was possibly, I don't know, likely how far you want to go, that's, you have to decide for yourself when you perhaps read the whole thing in the next year. Um, the, uh, so that it was likely used by somebody in the setting of education. If you find this going too far, then another thing uh, emerges. That is, do I still have five minutes? No. Mm -hmm. three minutes. <laughs> um, add this to the mix. Holster books, the 80 in my corpus, are almost never over 100 leaves, which is very unusual for medieval manuscripts. The majority of them are less than 50 leaves which means that you have not only very narrow books, but also very light books, which adds to the argument that it's a good for holdability, if that's what you want to uh, call it. Um, there is other indications, um, which I will um, uh, skip but one, that is the iconography. Now, we should also be careful, always be careful um, with these things, but there is a, a, an interesting link between education 
um, and poster books, and on the other hand also education and the iconography of holding a book in your hand. And you can see it here, two examples, I have many of these. Um, and they point out that the, the teacher actually holds it with one hand and has the other, one, uh, other hand available for doing other things. Some people that I talked to about this said so you can spank students around. <laughs> yes. But there's also the beautiful article by Amelia Zoboyle who points out that actually the right hand the teacher is used for emphasizing things, for disagreeing, for saying on the one hand, but on the other. <laughs> right? So the, and this is a, a thing that you also find in medieval handbooks of, of, of teaching and, and, and classroom um, settings. So it makes also sense from um, the standpoint of the teacher itself as well, perhaps, um, I'm very careful here, it's also uh, confirmed by iconographical... Here's a very beautiful one. He was in Victor, of course, the Uber teacher from the 12th century, the mother of the teacher, the father of the teacher. Uh, France, uh, this image was made in the 1190s. You can see that it's stretched, but you can also see that the book is held, held holding is actually very narrow. Um, I don't want to say this is sort of a holster book that he's holding, but it is, um, so I'm showing you this image to say that he's holding a book in one hand, flipping the, one, the, the page with the other, as do the students next to him holding it in one hand, and the other for notes, whatever. Uh, but this, you might even say, this looks very holstery to me. Uh, it does, at least to me. <coughs> so, um, in conclusion, I would say that the Hague manuscript that I started with, but projecting a little bit broader into books made for education, classical manuscripts that are very narrow, uh, medical manuscripts that are very narrow, um, are, I think it's safe to conclude, were made for um, holding it in your hand. I'm not saying that all narrow books are made for education, but I do want to say, and this is I think a new observation, that it was made so narrow so it's easily um, hold, held for a long period of time. I do emphasize again that these books are often very uh, thin as well, so weight um, is made to sort of uh, support this manner of use um, in other ways. If you want, um, and um, in the hesitation of this you know that I'm not really uh, comfortable in saying it out loud yet, but I'm doing it anyway. Um, you can say, well, perhaps this is then a predominant use of education. Perhaps we can say that narrow books are an indicator of the book used in the classroom, especially of course when the text um, already points in that direction.